Good morning. Good to see you here today. Welcome to Briar Hill Baptist Church. We are excited that you've come to be part of our fellowship today, and we trust God is going to move in your heart and bless you and encourage you, strengthen you. More than that, we're praying that you've come to worship the Lord Jesus Christ and to exalt Him. Amen? Amen. We're glad to welcome uh, vacationers back. Uh, we heard that people are still vacationing today, and I kind of believe it a little bit, but we had a great crowd in Sunday school today, and we want to say thank you for coming and being part of that. It's just more fun to be in a fellowship when there are a lot of us. Amen? And so we thank you for that and want to encourage you to come and be part of those things that are going on. We want to remind you of your worship bulletin and the things that are found in there, and especially this piece that you got today. This is Margaret Lackey time, and we're taking up an offering. We're always taking up an offering. <laughs> yeah, amen, we are. Uh, we give to the cooperative program, and the cooperative program supports all of our missionaries all around the world. But Margaret Lackey supports our missionaries in Mississippi. And so if you're one of those people, and I know some of you are, why do we send people all around the world? we got enough to do right here in Mississippi. I've heard some of you guys say that, right? Uh, we'd almost get a show of hands, and most of us would have said that. It, here you go. This is your sign. I mean offering. It's your offering to give, and all of it, every dollar of that is going to stay in Mississippi, and it's going to help with disaster relief and prison ministries, nursing home ministries, all kinds of stuff that goes on. You be sure to read that brochure, take note of that. The goal is $8,000, and we'd like to see you all uh, do that very quickly and shortly. So uh, think about those things and pray for the missionaries and, and lift them up. And thank you to our people who even are supported by the Margaret Lackey mission offering. Well, there's something else we need to do. We're going to have a little business this morning. Is that okay? We told you we were going to do this today. We're going to elect deacons. And so our deacon uh, vetting committee is here on the front. They have those cards and ballots. And uh, you pleasantly surprised us. We had 300 ballots ready, and they've gone to print some more. That's great. So we appreciate your being here and uh, selecting these guys. And I will be honest about this election. I've been praying about it through the week, and I'm in a quandary because for a change, I got to look at a list and try to decide what three guys am I not going to vote for. Now, that's hard because I like everybody on that list. I think everybody on the list is going to do a fantastic job if selected as deacon. And so that is a, a wonderful thing to report to you today. And uh, we want you to, to pray over this and uh, select that one that you believe God is leading you to select. You can vote for as many as six. As many as six. If you vote for more than six, we'll not be able to count your ballot because we don't know which six you meant. So we'll just have to throw it aside. You can vote for less than six, and your ballot will be counted. Okay? So if you just know three of those guys, and you don't know who else is on there, and you don't feel good about voting for somebody you don't know, you vote for just three, your ballot will count. So uh, those are the things that you need to think about. Uh, other thing that we need to remind you of is that unless you are a member of Briar Hill Baptist Church, you may not vote. Only members of Briar Hill Baptist Church can vote, okay? Let's pray right now and ask the Lord to bless us as we select these men who are going to help these others to serve this year as deacon. Father, we thank you so much uh, for the health of our church. That's all we could say today, Father, is that our church is healthy and growing and strong because we have more men than we even need today to serve in the number of deacons for this church. And Father, we've not seen that in a year or two or three or four. But Father, we see it today, and we just want to say thank you so much for that fact. And Father, we pray for divine wisdom that you would help us to select 
just the men that you'd have to serve, Father. And Lord, I pray for those two or three that may not be elected today. Lord, just to be on this ballot with such a fine group of men is quite an honor. And Father, we pray that you will keep them in your mind and heart and our church would keep them in our mind and heart as we go forward, that they'll have an opportunity to serve in the near future. Father, bless these men. May they be a glory to your name. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to ask this committee to pass those ballots out. You can vote for six or less. After you have finished your ballot, you may pass it back to the end of the row, and the committee will come through and pick up those cards, and they will tally those, and we will give you a report, possibly, by the end of this service. Now, while they're doing that, can you believe that Operation Christmas Child is in full swing? We have Christmas boxes on the pews out in the hallway already made up for you. Inside those boxes, you'll find some brochures that tell you what you can and cannot give uh, for the Operation Christmas Child. And uh, we're going to do that for the next two or three months so that we can have those things finished by uh, October or so. And that is our Love Does uh, emphasis for this coming month or two. And we want you to be sure to pick up those boxes. You do one or two a month, and you'd be in great shape, I think. I found a place that had squishies on sale for a dollar apiece this week. Just go buy them, you know. That's cheap. They'll squish down real small. You can stick them in those boxes. There's all kinds of other stuff that you can get. So remember Operation Christmas Child. But I also remind you of uh, Brotherhood Breakfast. Next week, 7 o'clock, down in the Family Life Center. Uh, We do have ladies who come to that breakfast. And we want to invite everyone to come. We have young people all the way up to old people like me who go to the breakfast once a month, 7 o'clock, Family Life Center. And we want to encourage you to come and and be a part of that next Sunday morning. We'd uh, also like to inform you about Equip You. Equip you, and uh, you can see that on the middle of the back of your bulletin. Chris, I'm looking for Chris. Chris going to be teaching that. I, how do you miss him with those white rimmed glasses? <laughs> Stand up, brother. I want people just to see your smiley face. He, he's going to be teaching. And uh, former youth minister, you know how those guys are. Fashionista. He's going to be teaching. He's got a wonderful, uh, I understand, wonderful uh, study that he's going to be doing. It's going to start at 4.30 this afternoon, and we want to encourage you to come. It is an all-adult discipleship class, and uh, it's going to be in the old youth room. If you go through this long hallway, go all the way to the end, look to the right. You'll find them in that big Sunday school class back there in the back and all adults members or non are invited to come so please come and uh, and support that and then the pictorial directory and I'm looking forward to that aren't you it's just fun to sit down and look and it's one of the greatest devices that I have found to use uh, when we've got a fresh one and an up-to-date one it's what I use to go through and look at your picture And I pray for you guys as I go through the book. And I think about who you are and what might be going on in your life. It is a wonderful spiritual tool. It's also a good thing for new members to come in and and grab a book and say, who was that that spoke to me? And you find out who they are. Listen, we started out with just three or four days. We're all the way up to about six days worth of photo taking. And uh, the days are closing quickly. And so if you have not signed up for your pictorial directory photograph, you need to do that ASAP as soon as possible. I think we've got up toward 150 families that have already signed up and uh, maybe more than that. We've had to open up days and open up days and open up days. So if you've not signed up yet, if you look on the back, there is a 1877 number. It's a free call. You call those guys tomorrow. 
and say, hey, I'm with Briar Hill Baptist Church, and I want to sign up for the pictorial directory. I think you'll have one choice of one day, but you can still get in on it. So please, please do that. Now, how many of you still have ballots in your hands and you've not turned them in? Anybody? If you have a ballot, hold it up so that our committee can pick that up. All right, then we assume that that has been accomplished. Again, thank you for coming and being part of our service today. To our guests today, thank you for your indulgence that we might do just a little bit of business as we began our service today. If you are a first-time guest, if you'd tear this piece off of your bulletin, fill it out, drop it in the offering plate today when the plates are passed, we will appreciate that record of your visit Right now, it's time just to sing hallelujah, praise the Lord, and all kinds of good stuff to Jesus Christ. Amen? Y'all ready for that, aren't you? Amen. Let's pray right now and do it. Father, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for the privilege of being in this place, and thank you for the privilege of worship. Father, remind us that we're coming before your very throne, and we are at your feet today, Father. We exalt you, we praise you, we honor you for being the God of creation and the God who redeems. Thank you for your son, Jesus, who has bled and died. He suffered for our sins and rose the third day victorious that we might have everlasting life. Father, we praise you for that wonderful, indescribable gift that you have given to us. Bless this time, Father. Be honored by all that we do and be well pleased in our faith. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother John. Let me invite you to stand, please, as we sing this great hymn of our faith. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine.
Join me as we pray, please. Father, you are the great I am. There is none other like you. There is none other beside you, Father. You are the only true living God, and we thank you for that. Father, we come to you this morning humbling ourselves in your presence, asking you to purge us and cleanse us of all our unrighteousness, and to set our minds and hearts right before you so that we can come before you and worship you today. Father, help us to have open ears and hearts and minds to receive your word. We ask your anointing of your Holy Spirit upon Brother Mile as he brings your word to us. Help us to listen attentively. Help us pray today, Father, that lives will be touched, lives will be changed. Father, for those listening today in this room and on live stream that are not Christians today, I pray for their salvation. Father, show them that there is no hope without you. Help them to understand that. Father, help all of us to realize to, to be more committed to you, to be more obedient to you. Father, that we need to just surrender ourselves to you each and every day of our life to fulfill the mission that you've called us to do. Thank you for all that you do for us each and every day. Thank you above everything else for your son, Jesus Christ, and the ultimate sacrifice that he made for us. And God, as we come today to give you our offerings, our tithes, we pray that you'll take these and that uh, you'll use them accordingly. Father, help us to be good stewards of what you've given us so that we may uh, support the various ministries of this church, the missions in this community, the state, and around the world. For it's in Jesus' name we pray.
could I invite you to stand once again as we sing.
Father, that you know exactly what's going on in our life. You know how many times that we failed you this week. And Father, even though we're probably not keeping track, Father, and you're not keeping track, Father, you know our hearts and our minds. So today, as we stand in your presence, Lord, I pray that we will do it just like Moses and just realize that we're on holy ground, Father, as we seek to serve you, as we try to find out exactly what you would have us to do with our lives. So, Lord, please forgive us. Father, I pray that uh, in a very humble way that you would take our lives, that you would use them, use them for your glory. And, Father, for the remainder of the service, as our pastor comes to preach, Father, I pray that you'll speak to him through him in a mighty way and in such a way, Father, that it will touch our hearts and help us to make a decision for you. So, Father, we love you. We continue to give this time to you, Father. And may you work in a mighty way in our lives. It's in your very precious name that we pray. Amen. 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 And we trust you have indeed worshipped today. We want to think about going back to school. How many of you would love to be one of those young'uns going back to school this next week? Me and Maurice. That's it. Man, I was a student, have been a student all my life. And uh, we worked right on up into doctoral programs and all those kinds of things. And I loved school. I started when I was five years old, and in the ancient days, there was no such thing in Lafayette County as kindergarten. I started the fifth grade, uh, first grade. <laughs> Might as well. A lot of good it did me, amen? I started the first grade when I was five, and I've been a student ever since. Still am a student. Study every day. Love it. I enjoy the camaraderie of school as well. And enjoyed going. And I hope and pray that our young people are like that. That you enjoy studying the rest of your life. If you ever stop studying, I really think you stopped growing. And so uh, I, I just, I'm high on academics and have always wanted my kids to do well. And they, oh man, I got college graduates, magna cum laude, and all that kind of stuff. So they did well and continue to do well. And so I think back on uh, those years in school, and I can remember the thrill of going into a class and taking a textbook and looking back in the front of it to see who'd had that textbook before me. Now, I don't think anybody gets to do that anymore, probably, very much. But when I was young, that was one of the thrills. And I remember distinctly opening up a book one day and looking and thinking, wow, my mother's sister had this book. (laughs) And she did. (laughs) Aunt Nancy's name, written right in my textbook. Man, I prized that textbook all that year, took care of it, carried it to show Aunt Nancy And she found a few scribblings, I'm sure, that were hers in that book. But textbooks, man, I used to love textbooks. You know, I've got a library back here that's uh, just uh, kind of a piece of what I have. I I have boxes of books all over the world. I've loaned you some books, and I never saw them back. And just, uh, and that's okay. You keep them, read them. Uh, But textbooks... Man, I just loved them. But when we start thinking about going back to school, and we're going to think about going back to school for the next four weeks, and it's kind of of a series of messages as we think about it. And we're starting today with our textbook. And let me remind you the most important textbook that you will ever have and ever have had is this one right here. And uh, textbooks change. Did you know that there are history people who are revising our history books right now? They're rewriting the history. Not just revising the textbooks, but many times you'll find that they are taking out of the textbooks things that we learned as kids 
that were pretty important. And they're putting things in that I think are almost non-relevant and some are irreverent and certainly irrelevant. But the world today, by and large, doesn't like Christians. We get a little flack around the world. Did y'all know that? Now, what people really don't like are not the Christians, I don't think, but it is our Lord that they don't like. They don't like the living word, Jesus Christ. And in order to discredit him, what they do is seek to discredit our textbook that tells us about who Jesus is. And so I can't emphasize enough today how important this book is. It is a holy treasure. I'm so glad that we get to go to vacation Bible school and sit and watch young people. Somebody will get the distinct privilege of standing up with a Bible in their hand. And that whole class of people in this room will stand and say, I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word, and will make it a a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path and hide its words in my heart that I may not sin against God. Man, that's the way to teach kids. And those kids, us, us too, we need to stick with it as well. Amen. And I just want to read a couple of scriptures to you today and talk about our textbook in just a few moments just to remind you that no matter what the textbooks out in the school have to say, they should all be measured by what the book has to say. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus, that's what's got to be true in your life. So turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We'll look in particular at verse 16, but we're going to read verses 14 through 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, 15, 16, 17. You must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise through faith, Uh, Wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture. Now, when he says all Scripture, he is talking in particular as a Jew. And he's talking about the Old Testament. And he's saying all of that Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man... Woman, boy, or girl, that word is anthropos, it just means all of the humans who are reading it, that the person of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now I want to flip over another few pages to 1 Peter. And let's read in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 24 and 25, portions of it. It says, all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now guess what? That is a quote from the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 40. And so the New Testament is validating the Old Testament. And if you read the Old Testament and then you read the New Testament, you'll find that the Old Testament validates the New for us as well. Very quickly, let me just share with you that this is the Word of God. I I just like to say very simply, it's the Word of God. Now, I know there's going to be some grammarians and, and people who are going to say, Hey, Brother Mal, don't say that. Just say it contains the Word of God. I just want to say it is the Word of God. And that's just the way I look at it. It is a word of revelation to us. It is God's revelation. Now, first thing that this this word can do for us is teach us some stuff. That's one of the neat things that a textbook could do for us. You could have, not even have a teacher, and you could take a textbook, you could open up that textbook, and you could read in there and learn facts. This textbook is special 
This textbook will teach you far more than just facts. The, the word used here is doctrine. Doctrine. It, it's good for doctrine. It's good for teaching. It's good for uh, us to understand truth. And, and I, I remember sitting at the table eating a meal with Dr. Herschel Hobbs. He was there in our home, and we were talking and sharing, and, and he made a statement about education way back then that has stuck with me. And he said, you know what? You're free to go out here and get you a liberal arts education. And if they want to get liberal on you, so be it. You knew what you were getting when you signed up for it. But when you go to seminary, seminaries are for indoctrination. I thought, wow, I'm going to keep that in my pocket. I'm going to remember that. Let me tell you what a Baptist church is good for as well. A Baptist church is good for taking our kids and indoctrinating them. And don't ever think that that is a bad thing. The Bible says of itself that it is good for doctrine. It's good for us to instill in our young people truth and an understanding of who God is. And by the way, if you don't indoctrinate your children, somebody else will do it for you. That's just a fact. Man, I long for the days when you might perhaps see a kid with a book like this in their hands looking and reading instead of a screen in their hands being taught who knows what. This is the Word of God, and it's good for doctrine. And we need to indoctrinate our ch children. And, and Paul even brings that up and says, you need to continue in the things that you've learned, that, that from childhood you've known these scriptures. And we need to take our little kids and just pour it in them, pour it in them, pour it in them. And give them a, a weapon, a defense, an understanding so that when they read in some other textbook something that contradicts the Word of God, they immediately understand it and know it. And they have to weigh it. He says, continue in what you've learned. Remember who taught you this. <laughs> yeah, I love my mama. My mom comes down and is here. And y'all can tell the difference in my preaching when she's here, right? I don't tell all those too many personal stories when she's here. <laughs> She never remembers it the way I do. <laughs> That's just a fact, isn't it? But you know who taught me to honor and value the Bible and the Word of God? My mother and my grandmother. That makes me feel like a Timothy, Lois and Eunice. Only it was Joanne and Mabel. That's who it was. My mama taught me to honor the Bible. And when I surrendered to preach, the very first book that was given to me was given by my grandmother, Mabel Pinion, and it was a commentary on the Bible. That's the very first book I got. She was in her way saying, man, I'm proud we've got a preacher in the family. And boy, she wore out books. She wore out the Bible. But you know what made a bigger impression on me? Was watching my daddy Take an a old green hardback Bible, the, the living translation, just to paraphrase. Man, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody to read and study. But my dad dropped out of school because he got too old to play ball. He did. I'm not joking. He aged out. He's too old to play ball. He's a great basketball player, baseball. Our family was drafted for Cleveland Indians, all kinds of stuff. Man, that's what was high on his list. His athletics, academics, forget that. When he got too old, he dropped out. Never finished high school. And so for me to sit and watch him literally read one of those old green paraphrases from cover to cover and literally wear the back off of that thing and he read it from Genesis to Revelation and he understood it. That made an impact on me. I value the Bible, folks. Why? Because when I was little, I was taught to. 
And it has never failed me yet. I've never found a time when the Word of God has failed. I have failed. I have misunderstood. I have misused. I have twisted. I have abused the Word of God from time to time. But it's never failed me. The Scripture is the textbook to carry with you and to use and to honor and revere and believe from childhood. <laughs> I believe that so much. Had a little girl laying in a crib in our parsonage. I'd go in there and I'd read to her out of the Bible. Wasn't Emily? <laughs> Jessica. She needed it more than Emily did. Grew out to be a preacher's wife, too. <laughs> you read the Bible to your kids, folks. And you believe it. And you let them know you may not always live up to it. But that's the standard we ascribe to. And when you fail, you fail. And you say, man, I failed. But this book, in my mind, in my heart, my eyes, is a perfect book. And it is the perfect book, handbook for faith and living. It's the Word of God. Now, by that, I mean that it is written by God. Who is the writer of this Word? It's God. God himself. And don't you know that if there is a God, and there is, amen, and he created us, he would most certainly want to reveal himself to us. What kind of silly God would it be to make you and just throw you out here on the earth and then just disappear? That's what the deists used to believe. <laughs> Horrible idea. God cared enough to make you. God never makes mistakes either. He made you just like he wanted you to be from now on. <laughs> make, model, year, fashion, Chevrolet or Ford. He made you that way. By that I mean male or female. It's who you are. And if he cared enough to make you, he cares enough for you to know who he is and reveal himself to you. And so throughout the ages, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 tells us that in the, the days gone by, God has written, God has done all kinds of things. He has revealed himself through the prophets. And, but in these last days, he revealed himself to us through Son, the Son, Jesus that's what God's been up to ever since Genesis came along. He's been revealing himself to us. And the scriptures tell us in the New Testament, the book of Romans, that even if you were to sit on your back porch drinking some good old coffee and you look up at the stars and the moon and the sky and you hear the thunder and you see the lightning and you feel the breeze and you feel the rain and, and you look around and two chameleons are chasing each other around the patio, you, know, you just got to sit there and think, somebody made all this. His attributes are clearly seen through the creation. God wrote the book, and he'd been revealing himself to us all along. And we're just so dense that we just don't get it. So he wrote a book. So here, read this. I'll tell you who I am. I'll show up from time to time and give you these words and write them down, and you can read them, and, and you can be understanding of who I am. God has revealed himself. And this scripture tells us that it is by the inspiration of God that we have it. The word inspiration comes from the word inspire, right? How many of you have ever had a respiratory disease? None of you, right? How many of you had the flu or pneumonia? Yeah, you had a respiratory disease. Spire inspire exhale y'all get it that, that literal word means God breathed that this book is the word of God and it is God breathed now God never breathed anything that wasn't perfect total and whole he just doesn't do it we're the ones that have messed things up but God inspired this book. 
He has given us the Holy Spirit to illuminate this book. That means to shine light on it and help us to understand it. And I'm not afraid to use this big old ugly word. It's more than four letters, but it's an ugly word in the world today. I believe it. I believe the Word of God is inerrant. Inerrant. Without error. God put it out there just like he wanted it. And he has preserved it. And we've got what we need to do life by. I have to take it as such. Because the writer of the word is perfect. Now, somebody mentioned this week about red letter Christians. Let me just time out for a minute. And remind you that the red letters in your scripture are somebody, somewhere along the way's idea that Jesus was speaking at that moment. It is an editorial comment. Okay? Now, from time to time, I say, kind of jokingly, but sincerely, if you've got a good copy of the Word of God, you're going to find some red letter stuff in there. Amen? Amen? Now, there are people who are posting on Facebook these days saying that they're not going to be an evangelical Christian anymore. They're going to be a red-letter Christian. Now, let me just quickly tell you what's wrong with that. Number one, Anthony Campolo came up with that, and Anthony's way off base on a lot of things. Okay? He's the one that wrote years and years and years ago. He wrote this book, It's Friday, but Sundays are coming. Great sermon. Great book. But he's liberal as a cat's back is arched when it's scared. I'm telling you. He is first and foremost a sociologist, and you've got to know that. And off the cuff one day, they just said that they were going to be red-letter Christians on a radio station. And that has picked up. Now there is a website that says redletterchristians.org or com. Don't go there. Why am I saying all of this? Because they want to just live by the red letter stuff. And they said, well, Jesus never said anything about homosexuality. They said, we ain't got to worry about that. Now, that's a dangerous statement to say that he never spoke about something. Therefore, it's not important. Let me just remind you of this. How, how many of you believe God wrote the Bible? Well, let me ask you this. Did he write just the red letter stuff or did he write the black stuff too? As a matter of fact, who do you think pinned down the red letter stuff in the book of Mark? Jesus or Mark? <laughs> yeah, Mark was the one who was inspired by God to put it down, right? You've got to understand that that is a dangerous statement to, to say the red letter stuff is more important than the black letter stuff. It is not. It is all equally valid. It is all equally important. It is just neat to be able to see what it is that Jesus said. And those words are alive and unique and wonderful. He's the writer of the word. Young, see, I got a lot of yellow left up there. <laughs> we better go, hadn't we? we got to hurry. Let me tell you about the witness of the Word. Did you know that the Word of God witnesses to itself? And it is so accurate and so complete. Um, scientifically, it's right. It's right. Did you all know that our scientific knowledge is constantly evolving? That, that's one thing that really is evolving. We're learning more and more and more. And guess what? The more we learn, the more it proves the Bible. That, think about this. In, in Job chapter 26 and verse 7, Job says that God hung the earth on nothing. Now, when was it that we figured out the world was hung on nothing? Huh? 1500s. <laughs> uh, but when was Job written? Possibly was the first book written down in the Bible. And yet God is revealing scientific information all the way back over there in Job 26. Or, or say Isaiah 40 that we quoted just a moment ago from 1 Peter. Not those very verses, but Isaiah 40 and verse 22 talks about the circle of the earth. 
the circle of the earth. You know, at first we thought the world just hung out there and it was flat. Did you know there's still some... <laughs> Y'all been reading it too, huh? Internet, flat earthers. Hello. You know, what's the Bible say? It's round. The Bible says the circle of the earth. And we could talk about not only uh, scientific, we could talk about economics, we could talk about sociology, we could talk about all kinds of stuff. Historical, that's where the world usually likes to say the Bible is wrong. And yet more and more and more we're digging up dirt. And when we dig up dirt, we find little coins and we find markers and we find these things that are written on tablets and we read and go, well, there really was a dude named Belshazzar who was in Babylonia after Nebuchadnezzar. It really did exist. And the Bible said so back over in the book of Daniel a long time ago. But we didn't discover that until 1853. A.D.? You know, the Bible is historically accurate. It has this internal unity, too. I mean, how many books are there? There's 66. 66 books, 40 authors or more. Over about 1,500 years. Three different continents. Three different languages. And yet there is this internal unity and harmony where it never contradicts itself. And if you think the Bible contradicts itself, it's just because you're not smart enough to understand it. It's true. The witness of the word. What does the world say about the world, though? Very quickly, here's why we're preaching what we're preaching today. Jesus warned us in the New Testament alone what the world would say about the Bible and how the world would view the Word of God. Now, in in 2 Corinthians, try and stay New Testament. I want to go old, right? Let me quickly just tell you this. Y'all mark it down. If you need copies later, I'll get them to you. Some peddle and corrupt the Word of God. He says, for we, Paul says, we're not as so many peddling the Word of God. And the word there means corrupting the Word of God, peddling. Uh, the idea is someone who is out selling the Word of God, and they've got maybe a, 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 let's say they've got a liquid that they're selling. You know, easy way to make more money and not invest, pour a little water in your stuff, right? Water it down. That's what the, the idea is, corrupting the Word of God. But he says we are of sincerity as from God. We speak in the sight of God in Christ. The world will corrupt the Word of God, and water it down and change it. you got to watch out for that. In Mark chapter 7, verse 8 and 9, Jesus speaking in red letter, good stuff here, <laughs> just as good as the rest of it. Laying aside the commandment of God, you, religious people, hold the tradition of men, washing of pitchers and cups and many other such things you do. He said to them, all too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition we change the Word of God because of our traditions. He said, don't do that. The world rejects Scripture. In Jeremiah, Old Testament, chapter 8, verse 9, the wise men are shamed, they are dismayed and taken. Behold, they have rejected the Word of the Lord. So what wisdom do they have? Man, that is one of the best words I hope you carry home with you today. They have rejected the Word of God. Thus, what wisdom do they have? Rhetorical question, which means none. None. First Peter chapter 2, verse 8. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed. Psalm 119, 158. And by the way, Psalm 119, the whole thing is about the word of God. Verse after verse after verse. 158 says, I see the treacherous and am disgusted because they do not keep your word in, in the New Testament. They misuse the word. Consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation is also our beloved brother Paul. This is Peter talking. According to the wisdom given to him has written to you, as also in all the epistles, speaking in them of these things, and some are hard to understand. But untaught and unstable people twist the scripture to their own destruction. That's what the world does to the word of God. Don't let them do that. Finally, 
Let me just remind you what this scripture in Timothy has to say about the work of the Word and how it does its job. It's quick. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder even bone and marrow. I mean, it'll get the job done. What does this scripture say? It's able to make you wise. How many of you want to be wise in a good way? You want to be a wise guy? You want to be wise? Scripture is able to make us wise according to 2 Timothy right here. It is profitable. How many of you want to take away something more than what you came with today? Open up the Word. Read the Word of God. It's profitable to you, and you will gain from it. And you will have more than you had before you started. The Scriptures prove itself and Christ. The Scriptures are there to prove to us that Jesus is who He says He is and that there is strength and power in the Word of God. It corrects error. And it guides us for right living. I'm out of time, all right? I just want you to know, folks, not intentional, but I could preach this all day long because I believe it's truth. And I like telling the truth. I feel bad when I lie. How about y'all? I like telling the truth. Thy word is truth. God's word is truth. God's word is important. Young people, there are going to be some people that will try to tell you in this school year that some of these things are archaic, and by that they mean old-fashioned. They're going to say that some of these things are inaccurate, and by that they mean it's in error and wrong. I just want you to make up your mind today that you're going to live by this book. And no, there's no error in it. It's right. It's right. And it's not old-fashioned. We just be happy to live in a time right now that just is losing their minds. That's all I can say. But for 2,000 years, the New Testament has stood the test of time. And thousands before that, the Old Testament stood the test of time. And what is found in here is a basis for civilization that God intended. And it's the best way to live. It's the best way to live. Believe the word. Now, one thing I hate to tell you today, but I need to, is simply this. The soul that sins, it shall surely die. That's in there too. But God loved us so much. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord, believing this word is true, believing he is the living word of God, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart God raised him from the dead. You'll be saved. Now, when you get saved, that means you're not going to hell. You're going to heaven. It also means that you're not going to live life the way you want to live it, but you're going to live it according to the revealed word of God. Now, there's somebody in this room that needs to make that decision today, and we invite you to come do that, to receive Jesus as your Lord. Profess him as your Lord. Confess him now. Maybe there's a Christian. You've been vacillating, worrying and wondering, what am I going to do? He hasn't cracked the book yet. <laughs> Shame on you. You got something going on in your life you need some insight and some wisdom for Open the Word of God. Commit yourself to do that today. And all of us need to commit ourselves anew and afresh to live by the Word of God. Whatever it is that God is calling you to do today, you come publicly and you do it now. Father, thank you so much that you're alive. You're real. You are a God in heaven. And you've revealed yourself to us. What an awesome thought. God, you've revealed yourself to us in your person through Jesus Christ. But I wasn't around back then, Father, to see him. Thank you that you wrote it all down in a book. And you made sure that book was just right and included just what you wanted 
so that you could reveal Jesus to me 2,000 years later. God, would you remind us here today that your word is sure and steady and steadfast. And Jesus said not one jot or tittle of it is going to pass away until it's all fulfilled. As a matter of fact, Peter said under your inspiration that the word of God endures forever. Oh, Father, help us to see how important this textbook is for our lives and for our learning and our living. Help us to come to you just now. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's stand saying you come. Step out quickly. Would you take a seat just for a moment and let me introduce to you Michael Rayburn. Yeah, Mike and I have been talking about this for a little while. Every, every now and then he'll look at me and say, I'm going to join that church one of these days when the Lord says it's right. Guess what? The Lord said it's right today. Amen. <laughs> Michael comes today to say that uh, he knows he's saved. He's going to go to be with the Lord when uh, the Lord comes. 
And uh, he wants to unite with our church with promise of a letter from a sister church. And uh, all in favor of that, you shout amen. 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 This beautiful wife of his beside him is already a member. And uh, she has been through a lot in the last year, year and a half. And God's just blessed her in such a supernatural way. Uh, if you want to be around somebody who is constantly praising God and saying, thank you, Jesus, you need to come by and see Susan before you leave today. Because uh, God's blessing and, and uh, that was, uh, he loves all, she loves all of you. And uh, she tells me that often. She loves this church. And uh, y'all have been praying for her and her recuperation, and you look great. You're a lot prettier than he is. <laughs> but he's a good-looking guy. He's got a smile on his face from ear to ear today. And, man, that, doesn't it just feel great to be a part of the family of God like this? It is so good. We're going to get them to come up to the front in just a moment. We'll give you the opportunity to come by and, and meet Mike if you've not met him. And uh, love on Susan and uh, just continue to encourage them and bless them. We love you all so much. We're excited about what God's doing in, uh, in you all. Is there any word before we leave? Amen. God is good. And all the time. Amen. Let's see. You want to tell them or me? I got the mic. John Barnes, Chris Barron, Charles Boyd, Harvey Dorch, Maurice Manning, and Bailey Smith will serve as your deacons alongside the others who are not rotating off for this coming year. Thanks to every one of those men who allowed your name to be placed on the, the ballot this year. Uh, seriously, that's the best slate of possible deacons. I think that I've ever had in any church at any time. And uh, we do. We love these guys, every one of them. Thank y'all so much. It's going to be a good year. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to ask Michael and Susan to come forward and uh, stand here at the front. We'll invite you to come by. If the ladies would play us a little bit of music. And uh, we'll give you the opportunity to greet them. Uh, and uh, Michael in particular, uh, into the fellowship of the church. And if you can, I'll need to hear a testimony from Susan before you get away today. It'll bless your heart. Well, let's stand. We'll be dismissed, and we'll invite you to come by. Be sure to come to church tonight. Did y'all know we have church at night? We do. We have a great time. Please come. Be a part of it. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer and be dismissed with this prayer. Um, and look forward to seeing you back here tonight. Randy, would you lead us in our prayer?